Hello, welcome to the Liberty Church of Christ for our midweek Bible study where we are going through the Bible. And we're in Genesis chapter number 37. Everybody get your Bible. Turn to Genesis 37 as we go through the rest of Genesis. Let's begin with prayer. Father God, thank you so very much for allowing us to study your Bible together. Help us to see that you protect your people and you keep your promises. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is lesson number four of going through the Bible, and we really appreciate you being with us. We're already down to chapter 37 in Genesis. And you remember that God has brought you down from uh, Adam through Seth, all the way down through Noah, Sham, Ham, and Japheth, but Sham is the promised one. He goes all the way down to Abraham. Abraham has two boys, Ishmael and Isaac, but it's not Ishmael, the promised one. It's Isaac. Abraham was giving the Abrahamic covenant that all the nations of the earth will be blessed through Abraham's seed. And that land, Canaan land, will belong to him and his seed. And then Isaac, that received the Abrahamic covenant, he had two boys, twins, Jacob and Esau. But Esau, the oldest, did not receive the Abrahamic covenant. It was Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. And he received the confirmation of the Abrahamic covenant. And he had 12 boys, and a daughter, but 12 boys. And these 12 boys, they would be the 12 tribes of Israel. A little bit different as we'll see later how that is all divided up. But who, which of those 12 boys gets the Abrahamic covenant? They all do. If you are of the tribe of Reuben, the firstborn, or if you're of the tribe of Benjamin, the last one, you have the promise of your father Jacob and his father Isaac, and his father Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you have that promise that the land is yours, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through the Abrahamic covenant. Now there's one of those boys that is going to be specific through, we'll see that later, but this is now a little change in the story. He's not going to give one of those boys the Abrahamic covenant per se, but he is going to, as he's going to bless them, he's going to bless one of them individually, specifically. It's going to be uh, the blessing that is going to be blessing to all the whole world. But at this particular juncture, the story is turned to Joseph. He's the 11th son of Jacob. Now, he's not the firstborn, but he's the firstborn of Rachel. And Jacob loves him more than he loves all of his brethren, and it's obvious. He makes him a coat of many colors, and that could be indicative of a coat signifying that I want you to take over when I'm gone. As a father dies, somebody's got to take over. Maybe he was uh, thinking of Joseph doing that, giving him this coat of royalty. But nonetheless, his brothers hated him. In fact, we see in verse 4 of chapter 37, when his brethren saw that their father, this is verse 4, chapter 37, when his brethren saw their father loved him more than all of his brethren, they hated him. That's a strong word, but that is exactly what they did. They hated him, and they could not speak peaceably to him. There was no love between those boys toward Joseph at all. And Joseph complicated things. Now, he's only 17 years old at this time. 17. But he complicates their relationship by these dreams that God sends to him. In one of the dreams, he dreams that he and his 11 brothers were out uh, harvesting the, the wheat, and they make sheaves, and those 11 sheaves bow down to his sheaf. And, of course, the interpretation is obvious, and these boys are, are bitter. You mean we are going to bow to you someday? There's no way that's going to happen. We hate you. He even dreamed a dream about the sun and the moon and the stars, 11 stars, that bowed to Joseph. And that means his mom and dad and, and all the, the, the brethren. And this even upsets Jacob a bit, his daddy. 
Look at verse number 10 of chapter 37. He told it, this dream about the sun and the moon and the 11 stars bowing down to him. He told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him. <laughs> Jacob said, this is not going to happen. It does happen because God has got a plan for Joseph. Now, Jacob sent Joseph to check on his brethren one day while they were out with the sheep, and they saw him coming a long way off because they could see to the field, and they saw him. Maybe his coat of many colors was so obvious and striking against the background, but they said, there comes this dreamer. Let's kill him, and we'll just say that some wild beast did it. When he got closer, uh, Reuben was the oldest of Jacob's boys, and he said, no, 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 let's not kill him. Let's just throw him in a pit somewhere. There's all kinds of wells around and, and dried up pits. Let's just throw him in one of them. Now, he was indicating to them that he would eventually die, but his heart was he was going to go back and get him. He wanted to deliver him back to his daddy. Maybe it was because Reuben was the oldest and felt responsible, but it may be because Reuben had had an affair with his daddy's wife. And maybe the guilt was still in his heart, and he couldn't do that to his daddy again. He couldn't hurt his father again. But whatever be the case, they did throw him in a pit, just like their plan was. And verse number 25 of chapter 37 uh, says something that just goes all over me. They sat down to eat bread. They took their brother, threw him in a pit, and had lunch. Can you imagine? That's their heart. And that's how hard their heart was. I, and, and I'm sure Joseph was not a quiet person there. Brothers, don't do this to me. Help me. But they still ignored it and ate their lunch. But they looked up and they saw some Ishmaelites coming through the area. Now these Ishmaelites, remember, are their cousins because they are descendants from Isaac, and Isaac's brother is Ishmael, so Ishmael's descendants, so they're cousins. And these Ishmaelites were on their way to Egypt to trade. And look in verse 26 of chapter 37. Judah, that's the fourth boy down, Judah said to his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother? He goes on to say, Let's sell him. We'll sell him. Now we know that when we sell him as a slave to these Ishmaelites, uh, he'll eventually get, wind up in Egypt and he'll die down there. We'll never hear from him again. Certainly, Daddy will never hear from him again. So let's just sell him. Now Reuben later, and they did the deal, they sold the boy into slavery. Reuben later returned to the pit. He expected to find Joseph in that pit to return him to his father, Jacob. But he didn't find him. He rent his clothes. He tore his clothes. That, that means he was sorrowful. Reuben did not want this to happen. And we're going to see that Reuben, for the next many years, is going to remind these boys, you shouldn't have done that. That was wrong for you to do this to Joseph. But they took the coat of many colors, they tore it into pieces, and they dipped it into a, uh, they killed a goat and took his blood and dipped it into goat's blood, and they brought it back to Jacob, and they lied to their daddy. Lied to him. Now Jacob, he lied to his daddy. Remember when he thought he was on his deathbed, and he stole that uh, blessing, and he was, he was lied to many times. But nonetheless, they lied to their daddy. And they said, Daddy, your boy, your favorite boy, has been killed by a wild beast. Now they're going to have to live with that lie for many years. Now, Joseph was carried on over to Egypt and he was sold to an officer of Pharaoh. Now that puts him close to Pharaoh, but he was an officer of Pharaoh. The man's name was Potiphar. Potiphar was the captain of the guard. So it was a very prominent and important person that Joseph became a slave to. But he was just a slave. He was just a Hebrew slave sold as a laborer, no doubt. But things are going to change soon. But chapter 38, 
the story shifts just a little bit, it gives Joseph's story a break, and it focuses on Judah. Let's talk a little bit more about that guy who said, let's sell our brother. That's what kind of heart he had. Well, Judah married a Canaanite woman. Now, this is wrong. It grieves your parents if you marry outside the family, remember? But he did, and he had three boys. Their name was Ur, Onan, and Shelah. Now, Ur being the oldest, Judah said, I will go get you a wife, and he did. He got Tamar to marry Ur. But the Bible says that Ur was a wicked man, and God slew him. Now, Tamar is a widow. And so Judah said, well, what I'm going to do, this is what we do. We take the wife of the dead uh, boy and we give her to the next boy. And the next boy will raise up seed to the dead boy. So he came, calls in Onan and he gives Tamar to Onan. Onan was supposed to raise up seed to Ur, but he refused to do it. And when he refused to do it, God killed him too. Now Judah has got two boys dead. They've both been married to that same girl, Tamar. He's supposed to give her to Sheila, his third boy, but he doesn't. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe he will die. So he sends Tamar off and he says, I promise you when Sheila gets a little older, I will call for you and, and y'all can get married and you can have babies, which is what Tamar wanted. But Tamar is in widow's clothes, and she's, she's a widow of two husbands, and she's very upset because she knows that Judah is not giving Sheila to marry. And this means she'll have no children. Well, she learns that Judah has brought his sheep into a field nearby the city where she was. So she takes off her widow's garment, and she puts on a prostitute's garment. And she sits in a certain place. And when Judah comes by and sees this prostitute, he doesn't recognize her. She's disguised herself. And Judah doesn't know that it's, that it's his Tamar, that it's his daughter-in-law. And he comes to her and says, May I buy your services? And she said, Well, what will you give me? He said, Well, I'll give you a goat from my, my flock. She said, I don't see any goat here. Well, it's out in the field outside the city. Here, take my ring and take my bracelet, and take my staff, and that will uh, be a pledge. Uh, sort of like we'll give our license to someone to hold it, uh, maybe while we go test drive their car, as a pledge that we'll bring the car back. But he says, I'll give you these pledges, and I promise you, I'll send that goat. Well, she sells the service, and she becomes pregnant. Now Judah goes back to the flock. Tamar puts back on her widow's garments and leaves the scene. When Judah comes back with a goat, Tamar's gone. He says, where's the prostitute that sits right here in this, this area? And the folks around said, there is no prostitute sitting there. We, we don't have a prostitute in this area. He says, well, I tried to pay her, but the debt's off of me. Well, about a few months later, it becomes obvious that Tamar is with child. And people come run into Judah. And they say, Judah, you know your daughter-in-law, Tamar, who's supposed to be in mourning and widow's garments? She's with child. And Judah becomes angry. And he says, let her be burned. And he's capable of doing just that because you remember, he sold his own brother. So he's capable of burning his daughter-in-law. So he brings her to be burned. And right before they burn her, she says, let me show you something. And she produces the ring and the bracelet and the staff. She said, whose are these? And he knows then, that's mine. You were the harlot. And those babies in your body are my children. So he says, she's more righteous than I because I refuse to give Sheila to her. He says, I'll marry her. And he does. He marries his own daughter-in-law for himself, but he never touches her again. And the two boys are born. One boy's name is Zara, Z-A-R-A-H. They're twins. Now, Zara sticks his hand out first. It's a breech birth, and uh, the 
midwife there, she takes a scarlet cord and she wraps it around his hand real quick because the firstborn gets uh, all the blessings, right? And uh, so Zara sticks his hands out first and, and she puts that cord around it, but he withdraws his hand. And then out comes Faraz. He's actually the younger because he didn't come out first. And then Zara comes out. But Zara is considered the oldest and Faraz is considered the youngest. But Faraz, the youngest, is in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Go to the New Testament and read that lineage and you'll find that Fares is in that lineage. Now we're going to chapter number 39. Potiphar owns Joseph. And he saw right away that the Lord was with Joseph because everything that Joseph touched turned to gold. It was blessed. Now, Joseph didn't want to be a slave. Make no mistake about that. He didn't enjoy that. But he did what was right. Even though the circumstances were not his favorite, and he didn't want to be there, he just did the right thing. And as a result, God blessed him for it. But I can imagine that there were many nights that Joseph just prayed to God. The Bible doesn't say this, but I can just imagine this. God, you're blessing me so much. Why don't you bless me with a ticket home out of this slavery? But God doesn't. God is using Joseph, preparing Joseph, for something in the future. But Joseph has no clue. He doesn't, this doesn't sound like God's using me for something in the future, but I tell you what I'm going to do. Regardless of my circumstances, regardless of what's going on in my life, I'm going to do the right thing. And I know God will take care of me. And sure enough, God blesses him because he just does the right thing. In fact, when Potiphar's wife wanted to have Joseph. Joseph said, no, that's not right. And so when they find themselves alone in the house, she reaches and grabs his coat and she says, lay with me. And he says, absolutely not. That's not the right thing. And so he runs out of the house, but he leaves the coat behind in her hand. Well, she's furious. And she accuses Joseph of trying to force himself upon. Look, I have his coat. Look what he tried to do to me. Potiphar then puts him in prison. Now, Joseph did not want to be in prison, but as he was in prison and found the circumstance so, he just did the right thing. And because he did the right thing, God blessed him even in prison. He became the, the high ward. In fact, the Bible says that the person in charge of the prison didn't even check on Joseph. He just let Joseph do whatever he wanted to do because Joseph caused that prison to be blessed in many ways. Chapter number 40. Now this prison, we're going to see, is not full of poor people and, and slaves uh, per se. Uh, these, are, these are probably people in the king's court. Just like Potiphar. Potiphar was a captain of the guard. He, he was an officer of Pharaoh. So if he wanted to put his slave, Joseph, into prison, he had that right. So these are, these are high up people in this prison. It may be that Potiphar didn't put Joseph to death because he knew that he had a God that was blessing him. He didn't want to make that God mad. But other important officials were in this prison as well. And here comes the next two people that's going to be in that prison is Pharaoh's butler and Pharaoh's baker, chapter number 40. And they both dream dreams. Now, the butler's dream that he told to Joseph, he says, you know, I, 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 there was a, a grapevine and it had three branches and I, I squeezed the grapes out of those uh, grapes from those three branches and I squeezed them into a Pharaoh's cup and I, and I handed it to Pharaoh. Reckon what that dream means. Now, Joseph said, I can't interpret dreams, but I know God who does. And here is the interpretation of your dream. The three branches are three days. And in three days, you are going to be reinstated to your old job. And you will once again deliver the cup to Pharaoh. And I'm asking you, Mr. Butler, I don't want to be in prison. Uh, I, I, I'm not guilty of anything. 
I was sold as a slave and, and was falsely accused. I, I'm in jail for no reason. But I'm asking you, when you get back to Pharaoh's ear, would you put in a good word for me and get me out of this place? Well, the baker heard that the dream was favorable, so he said, well, let me tell you my dream. He said, I had uh, three baskets on, on top of my head, and it was for the Pharaoh, but, but what happened was birds came and, and eat the bread and things out of the baskets. What does that mean? And Joseph said, you know, the three baskets are three days. Oh, really? Sounds familiar. But in three days, you're going to be hanged. And sure enough, after three days, the butler was restored to his position and the baker was hanged. Unfortunately, the butler forgot all about Joseph. Chapter 41 tells us that it was about two years that he forgot. Two years later, now Joseph's been in prison for two years. He's 17 when he got a soul. And now here he is in prison. And it's been two years. And Pharaoh dreamed a dream. And Pharaoh told all of his wise people that's supposed to know how to interpret dreams. He said, I've dreamed of dreams. Matter of fact, there was two of them. And it really upset me. What does it mean? He said, my first dream, there were seven fat cows. And then there were seven skinny cows. And the seven skinny cows ate the seven fat cows. And they didn't get any fatter. And it woke me up. And I was all disturbed by this dream. So I finally got back to sleep. When I did, I had another dream. And there were seven fat, plump, juicy ears of corn, probably wheat. And uh, it was followed by seven dry and blasted and not good corn. And those ears, the bad ears, ate the good ears. What does it mean? Well, nobody could tell him. But we find out that verse number 9 of chapter 41, the butler says this, I do remember my faults this day. I forgot about a guy in prison and he interpreted my dream and the baker's dream and they came true. I think that you ought to consult this man, this Joseph. Well, they do consult Joseph and when they bring him before the uh, Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh is told by Joseph, I can't interpret dreams, but I know a God that can. Now, he's, he's pretty direct to Pharaoh. God, my God, can interpret this dream. And here's the meaning of the dream. There's going to be seven years of plenty, more abundant food than you can possibly eat. But after that seven years is over, there's going to be seven years of famine, horrible famine. In fact, it's going to be so bad that anything that you had in the seven years, you're not even going to remember it. It's just going to wipe out any good thing. And he told you this twice, Pharaoh, in two different dreams. Look at verse number 32 of chapter 41. And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established. It's going to happen. It's established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. You know, how many times, by the way, has Moses, in the writing of Genesis already up until these chapters, how many times has God told these Israelites that Canaan land is theirs? Over and over and over, God makes the promises that it's your land. It's your Abrahamic covenant. Go get it. And yet, they don't believe. And they're going to suffer for that because of their unbelief. They're going to die in that wilderness. Folks, when God makes a promise, He intends to keep that promise. But Joseph gives some advice. He says, here's what you really need to do. Uh, during the seven years of plenty, you need to put a tax on everybody. You need to get a fifth part of everybody's produce. That's 20%. Put a 20% tax on everything, on everybody. 
and take that 20% of all of their produce and store it in the barns so that when the seven years of famine hits, you'll be prepared. Well, Pharaoh loves the idea. And he says, I can't think of a, a wiser man to be in charge of it than you, Joseph. So he puts Joseph second in command, only under Pharaoh. And he changes his name. He calls him Zaphnath Paneah. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but some people say that in Egyptian, that means God speaks and he lives. So he named him a godly name. This is somebody that God talks to. He gave him a wife. And so now Joseph is married. And he's got an Egyptian name that means God speaks and he lives. And so we find out in verse 46 that Joseph is 30 years old at this time. And he got sold into slavery at age, at age 17, remember? And now here he is 30 years old. And he has two sons by his new wife. Their name is Manasseh and Ephraim. And we'll hear from them later. But the famine hits after seven years of plenty. And Joseph opens the storehouses. And people come around it. Because they have nothing to eat. The, the famine is horrible. And not only the Egyptians come around it, But all of the countries come to Egypt. Because they find out. Egypt's got food and to spare. So, so let's go and trade with them and get something to eat. Even the Israelites, the, the sons of Jacob, have to come and ask for food. Since the seven years of plenty uh, has ended and the seven years of famine started, that makes Joseph 37. He was 30 when he got married, got in control. Now the seven years of plenty are over, so he's 37. It's been 20 years since Joseph was sold into slavery. He's 17, now he's 37, and when those boys get there, those 10 brothers, they're not going to recognize him. Not only is he 20 years older, but he's also uh, a famous Egyptian. He, he probably walks like an Egyptian, talks like an Egyptian, looks like an Egyptian, all of these things. And so they're not going to recognize him, but he's going to recognize them. Look at chapter number 42. Ten brothers come. Now remember, he's got 11 brothers. But one of them, Benjamin, stays home. And they all come to him asking for food, and they all bow down to him. And in verse number 9 of chapter 42, Joseph remembers the dreams that he had 20 years ago. They're coming true. But he don't know about these boys. Uh, as far as he knows, they still are the hard-hearted, horrible boys that sold him into slavery. So he tests them. He says, you're spies. You've come to spy out Egypt to find our flaws so that you can attack us. And they said, we're not spies. He said, okay, tell me your story. Where are you from? He said, well, we're from Canaan land out here. We're just wanderers. And, uh, and we got a daddy and there's a brother back home. And he says, okay. If that's true, I want you to go back home. I'll sell your food to you. But you go back home and you bring your brother back. And that'll prove to me that you're not really spies. Let one of your brothers stay here, though, as a pledge. So that uh, I know you'll come back with your younger brother. Now Reuben turned to all those boys. And he spoke in Hebrew. He didn't know that Joseph could understand every word he said. But Reuben said, boys, this is all your fault. You should not have sold Joseph into slavery. That's been on Reuben's mind for 20 years. It's been on those boys' mind for 20 years. It, I can imagine that for the last 20 years, every time something bad happens, every time a, a, a rainstorm comes that wiped away some crops, he might have said, this is your fault because God's punishing you for what you did to Joseph. And he certainly turns around and says, this is your fault. It's what you did to Joseph. It's the reason we're in trouble. And Joseph is hearing every word they're saying and understanding every word they're saying. But Reuben turns around, blames his brothers on why this is happening. And Joseph doesn't let on that he knows. And he takes Simeon, 
from all the ten boys, and he keeps him. He said, he'll be my prisoner until you get back with that younger brother of yours. Well, when they get back home and they open their bags, their money is in it. Because Joseph had told the servants to put their money back in the bag. Well, this sent fear through them. Well, they, he's going to think we're robbers. He's going to think we're a crook. Well, they told Jacob, their father, they said, we've got to take Benjamin back with us uh, next time we go for food. And Jacob said, no way, absolutely not. I'm not going to allow Benjamin to go. I've already lost Joseph, I'm a favorite son of my wife, Rachel. She died giving Benjamin birth. I'm not going to risk his life. And Reuben come to him, the oldest boy. He said, Daddy, you can kill my two boys if I don't bring him back. He knows how much he cares for Benjamin. He probably knows he doesn't care for his two sons as much as he cares for Benjamin, but these are still Jacob's grandsons. And he, but he's offered, you can take, you, guess how much I promise you I'll take this boy back. Uh, Benjamin, I'll get him back home. You can have my two boys and kill them. But Jacob wouldn't have it. He said, there is absolutely no way. Look at verse 38 of chapter 42. My son shall not go down with you, for his brother, Joseph, is dead, and he is left alone. Benjamin's left alone. If mischief, if mischief befall him by the way in which you go, then shall you bring my gray hairs down with sorrow to the grave. I'll die of heartbreak. Not going to happen. Well, in chapter 43, the food runs out. The food that they brought from Egypt is gone. They're starving. Maybe Jacob was hoping that the famine would break. It's not going to break. He don't know there's going to be seven years of famine. The food runs out. And Judah, now this is the guy that said, sell Joseph. This is the guy that threatened to burn his daughter-in-law. This is Judah now. He comes to Jacob. And he said, we have got to go back to Egypt. And we have got to bring Benjamin with us. And Judah said, I'll take care of him. I will make sure that I get Benjamin back home safely to you, Daddy, if you'll let us go. And Jacob agrees because his whole family is starving. Well, when they got back to Egypt, Jacob saw Benjamin after 20 years. I don't know how ben old Benjamin was, uh, maybe just a, a young boy, but now he's in his 20s, and he saw him. Now, here Joseph is, he's, he is, uh, what, 37, and he, and he sees his younger brother Benjamin for the first time, and when they get back to Joseph, they t explain to Joseph, here's Benjamin, our younger brother, like you told us to bring him back, but also, remember there was money in our sacks, and we didn't take it, here's double money, we're going to pay you double. And Joseph said, don't worry about it. Your God has blessed you. Keep your money. I'm just glad you're back. So they all bowed down again. And when they did, Joseph had to leave the room to cry. He saw Benjamin. He saw his brothers bowing down again. He saw their heart. And he fed them. He put them in a, in a feast. And he set them down by the order of their birth from Reuben all the way down to Benjamin. And when these boys noticed that, how did he know that? He's got to be a diviner. He's got to be somebody that knows things. Well, chapter 44, Joseph is going to give them a final test. He sends them off, and, and he puts his cup, he has his servant put his special cup in the sack of Benjamin. And when they get off from Egypt, headed back to Canaan land, to their father, uh, Joseph sends a crew after them. And the crew said, you have stolen Joseph. They don't know he's Joseph, but you have stolen his cup. They said, we have not stolen this cup. And they said, well, we're going to take, we're going to search your bags. They said, we're searching. We, we didn't steal this thing. And so they found the cup in Benjamin's bag. This upset those boys so badly because they got to get Benjamin back home to Jacob. And they said, don't worry, we'll take Benjamin back to Egypt. And you, you boys, just 
Go on about your way. Go home. You're free. Now, 20 years ago, this would have been a great proposition for them. Just get rid of the younger boy and we're free. That's what they did to Joseph. But that's not a good proposition for them now. Their hearts have changed. And they come back to Joseph. And in verse 14 of chapter 44, Judah says to Joseph, Take me instead. I sacrifice myself to be your slave. Please let Benjamin go home to daddy. Now that's a change of heart. 20 years ago, sell him. Today, take me instead. Read the rest of chapter 44, please, to see the earnest appeal of Judah. Judah's heart is shown there. In chapter 45, Joseph can't keep himself anymore. He just busts out crying. And he reveals himself. And, and of course, the brothers are all stunned. They, they thought Joseph was dead for sure. And here he is. They can't believe it. And in verse number 5 of chapter 45, here's what Joseph tells them. Be not grieved nor angry with yourself. I heard what Reuben said to y'all about selling me and, and how grieved you must have been for the last... 20 years, I can see that now. But don't be grieved with yourself. For God did send me before you to preserve life. Now you meant it for evil. But God, he meant it for good. He's going to tell them that later. But I got something to tell you boys. There's two more years of famine. So now Joseph is much older, right? From 37 plus 5. So now he's in his 40, maybe 42. He said, but there's two more years of famine. He said, I want you to go home, get daddy, and bring back the whole family and live in the land of Goshen right here in Egypt. So Jacob was told that Joseph is alive. Jacob can't hardly believe it. For these many years, 20 plus years now, I thought my son was dead. And then we see in chapter number 46 that Jacob and his family all moved to Egypt and Jacob meets Joseph. And what a heart touching episode that is. Read that in chapter 46. They fall on each other's neck and, and hold each other and kiss one another for some time. Then in chapter 47, Jacob, listen, bless Pharaoh. Now we know that the lesser is blessed by the greater. And since Jacob blessed Pharaoh, then Jacob is greater than Pharaoh. Now, when Moses is writing that to these people who have just gotten out of bondage from Pharaoh and the God of heaven has just destroyed Pharaoh's army, you guys are better than Pharaoh. You're greater than Pharaoh because your daddy was. It is something that God is telling them. I protect my people. I bless my people. But we also find out in chapter 47 that everything fell. The economy collapses. And when it does... People at the mercy of the government, at the mercy of Pharaoh, because Pharaoh owns all the grain, and he gets wealthy. He, he controls all the power. He is in full power now. And in chapter number 48, we learn that Jacob is on his deathbed, and he blesses his boys. Bring all the boys in. I want to bless them. The first that he brings is Joseph comes in with his two boys, Manasseh and Ephraim. Now remember, Manasseh is older than Ephraim. And, and Joseph approaches uh, the bed of, of jo Jacob or his, his front of him and he says, I want you to bless my two boys, your grandchildren. And so he intends for Jacob to put his right hand on the older boy and his left hand on the younger boy. Put your right hand on Manasseh and put your left hand on Ephraim. But as Jacob reaches out, intentionally, he swaps over and he puts his right hand on the younger boy, Ephraim. And he blesses him. And, and, and Joseph looks down and notices him. He becomes upset. He says, Daddy, no. Put your, move your hand. And he goes, no, son. This younger boy, Ephraim, will be greater than the older boy, Manasseh. And we see that comes to pass. And that's true. In chapter 49, Jacob blessed the rest of his boys. Now, Reuben doesn't get that special blessing that we talked about earlier. We're not talking about the Abrahamic covenant per se, but, but all the nations of the earth to be blessed to the seed. 
We are talking about that. There's more to the Abrahamic covenant. There's the land promise, and, and you're going to be many nations, all these things. But that seed promise, it's not going to be Reuben's. Why? Well, he, he had an affair with my wife. I'm not going to bless you with that seed promise. And Simeon and Levi, you're not going to get that either because of what you did in the Dinah episode with uh, Hamar and, and Shechem. Judah, you're going to get that seed promise. And sure enough, through Judah, the tribe of Judah, is where the lion of the tribe of Judah comes. And that is Jesus, the seed promise. But he goes on and he blesses the rest of his boys in chapter number 49. Then finally in chapter 50, Jacob dies. He dies and Joseph goes to Pharaoh and he says, uh, you're my boss. I'm still your slave, really. Even though he was this powerful and this rich, he's still a slave to Pharaoh. And he asks permission. Can I take my daddy and my people and go over to the Canaan land and, and bury my daddy in the cave of Machpelah? Because my grandfather, Abraham, bought that cemetery plot, buried him. He was buried in it. His wife's buried in it. And I want to bury my daddy. Uh, Isaac's, you know, and I want to bury Jacob in him. So, uh, so that would actually be his great-grandfather, Abraham. But nonetheless, he carries him to the cave of Machpelah, and he buries his daddy Jacob in the cave of Machpelah. But Joseph grows old. And when he's about 110, when he is 110 years old, he's going to die. But prior to his death, he says, I want you all, all of my people, I'm going to give you a prophecy. God's going to protect you. God's going to take care of you because He has a promise for you. He's going to come and get you out of Egypt and He's going to carry you into that promised land where the Abrahamic covenant was given. And I want you guys to promise me you will take my bones back and bury me with my family. Now it's 430 years later. Joseph has been dead for 430 years, right? He's mummified, probably, as an Egyptian in a coffin. And when Moses comes on the scene and they uh, delivers all the people out of Egypt, guess what they bring with them? They bring the coffin of Joseph. And if I'm reading this story for the very first time, and I read that promise that Joseph makes us make, to take his bones back to Canaan land. And then I look up for my reading, and way off in the distance there, I see that coffin. There he is. It's 430 years later, but there he is. And we're taking him home. Just like we promised, and just like God promised. Really enjoyed the study of Genesis so far, and we'll... Pick up there in the Exodus next week and I really appreciate you being with us. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for keeping your promises and allowing Moses to write this down so that we will be reminded of the fact that you are a promise-keeping God and you are our protector. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God willing, we'll see you next week.